be released from Guantanamo. In the building behind me sits the man with the power to release them. And so we're here again after President Obama's initial promise to close Guantanamo was broken, and now after his recommitment to close Guantanamo has resulted in zero men being released. We are here to ask the president, to plead with the president, to release these 86 men, and then to release the rest of the men who remain in Guantanamo. And so we come today with heavy hearts, but we also come today with a sense of hope. We know the men in this prison are using the only tool that they have, their own body. And we as American citizens need to amplify their voices and their struggles and join with them. So thank you for being here today. And we invite you to join us today and beyond until Guantanamo prison is, is shut down. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. And my name is T.C. Morrow with the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. And next I'll introduce my colleague, uh, Laura Markle Downton. Today we light this candle to include in our presence the 166 men at Guantanamo. Now I introduce uh, the executive director of the National Religious Campaign Against Torture, Reverend Richard Kilmer. Thanks, DC, and thank you all for being here uh, today. This is an extremely important witness, and we're glad that you are all here to make it as clear and as vigorous as possible. In 1997, the United Nations decided to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the enactment of the Convention Against Torture by declaring June 26 today the International Day in Support of Victims of Torture. The International Day of Support of Victims of Torture is important for a number of reasons. It's important to the victims of torture, many of whom are here today, because it recognizes the great harm done to their human dignity. Torture is an attack on their viscera. In addition, the day is important as a reminder to the nations of the world of their responsibility to provide caring and healing to the victims. There is a United Nations voluntary fund for the victims of torture. The U.S. actually provides the bulk of the support for this important fund, which supports treatment centers around the world. But unfortunately, sadly, U.S. support has declined during the recent years. Recent efforts to restore funding have not yet been successful and need your help to make sure that those funds are available for the victims of torture. This day is also a re an important reminder that torture is prohibited by law in 151 nations. In 1988, President Ronald Reagan signed the UN Convention Against Torture, which includes the commitment that no exceptional circumstances whatsoever, whether a state of war or a threat of war, international political instability, or any other public emergency may be invoked as justif justification for torture. Unfortunately, after 9-11, the U.S. government turned its back on the Convention Against Torture in the name of the war on terrorism, CIA and military interrogators tortured 9-11 detainees. More than 11 years after the U.S. government transported the first prisoners from Afghanistan to Guantanamo Bay, and four years after President Obama signed an executive order promising to close it within a year, it remains open. It remains an open moral wound a symbol of the violation of our nation's deepest values. Though President Obama has reiterated his commitment during his May 23rd speech at the National Defense University to close the detention center, we have to walk every step of the way 
with the president to ensure that Guantanamo is closed. We were all very grateful for the statement of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops issued yesterday asking the Secretary of Defense to make good on the President's commitment to close the detention center that has become a symbol of indefinite detention without trial. They, they quote, detainees have the right to a just and fair trial held in a timely manner. The indefinite detention of detainees is not only injurious to those individuals, it also wounds the moral reputation of our nation, compromises our commitment to the rule of law, and undermines our struggle against terrorism. There's another task that we have besides closing Guantanamo. And this task is necessary in order to make sure that torture never happens again. The Senate Intelligence Committee has prepared a 6,000-page report on CIA torture. The committee approved it in a bipartisan vote on December 13th of last year. It now needs to agree to release this report. The public needs to have a comprehensive picture of the facts of U.S.-sponsored US torture. The truth does make us free, and understanding what occurred helps ensure that our nation will never engage in torture again. To honor the victims of torture requires that we vigorously work to close Guantanamo and to ensure that the facts about the CIA's use of torture are released to the public. I am glad that I have all of you as colleagues in this effort because that's the only way that we're going to get these tasks done. Thank you. Professor at Georgetown University Ball Center. Hi, thanks for coming today. It's really hot, isn't it? But your pain is just for today, and some pain for longer than that. But your pain is just for today. Imagine the pain of the men at Guantanamo for over 10 years. I started representing detainees in March of 2002. That was over 11 years ago. That was when people didn't even know anything about Guantanamo. And what we did know, we were told it was the worst of the worst, and terrorists, and people who were captured on the battlefield. But today, 11 years later, we know differently, don't we? We know that 95% of the men at Guantanamo were never accused, or never found to have actually committed any hostilities against the United States. 86 men have been cleared for transfer or release. Why are they still there? 100 men, as you know, are on hunger strike. 40 are being force fed. Senator Feinstein went recently because she was concerned about the hunger strikers. And afterwards, she wrote a letter to Defense Secretary Hagel saying, I'm concerned because the uh, force feeding policies are out of step with international norms, medical ethics, and the practices of the US Bureau on Prisons. Out of step. What she really meant was that those policies violate Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions, which prohibit humiliating and degrading treatment, and those policies violate the United Nations Convention Against Torture. That's because force feeding, what is happening to, to 40 men at Guantanamo, means being strapped into a six-point restraint chair, having tubes shoved down your nose against your will, the tubes go into your stomach, and you get insure pumped into you six time or twice a day. That is a form of torture. That is torture. Why are the men at Guantanamo doing this? Why are they doing this? Because they are protesting their indefinite detention. Indefinite detention is another form of torture. My previous organization that I worked for, Physicians for Human Rights, came out with a report in 2011 finding that medical evidence shows the physical and psychological trauma of indefinite detention. Medical evidence shows that the uncertainty of not knowing when you'll ever be released, if ever, if you'll ever have a trial, or if you'll ever see your family again, shows that causes severe damage to your immune and your cardiovascular systems and a whole host of other problems, physical and psychological. And in many cases, indefinite detention rises to the level of torture, all right? That sounds very clinical and textbook, I know. So let me tell you about some of the men that I have represented. 
All right, Fauzi Al Oda. He was brought to Guantanamo in January of 2002. He's a Kuwait citizen. His father is an Air Force colonel with the Kuwait military who fought alongside the U.S. in the first Gulf War. There have been no charges against Fauzi. Obaidullah. That's my former client, Obaidullah. He was picked up when he was 19. He's been there for over a decade. Can you imagine spending a decade of your life away from your family? He had charges against him, but those charges were dismissed, meaning there is no evidence of any crimes that he's committed. Why is he still at Guantanamo? Obaidullah is on hunger strike, and he has been for, as we hear, 141 days. Obaidullah wrote this poem. I'm going to read you an excerpt. It's called, Life is for Love. The moon had thousands of complaints. She had wept heartfully. Her tears were shed on the flowers. She was saying that life is for love. There are left but a few days of life. Then why do you hate and oppress and always fight each other? You are wise and privileged. You are the best of all the creatures. Then make prosperous this world by the power of your wisdom. Choose for yourselves and others the laws of humanity. Indeed. Where is our humanity? Thank you. Uh, the retired Colonel Ann Wright and uh, Med uh, on my left and Medea Benjamin, uh, who are with Code Pink. <laughs> if I could ask all the people who went on our trip to Yemen to please come up also, Jody and Pam and Ty. Uh, first, I want to say, as a retired U.S. Army colonel, I spent 29 years in the U.S. military, and what our military is doing to these men down in Guantanamo is, uh, is a crime. And I call upon our military people to stop, stop doing what they're being told by the political masters to do. It's wrong, it's wrong, it's illegal, and they will suffer for this for the rest of their lives for what they're doing to these men. Now, I want to also mention that we have other hunger strikers that are here. Diane Wilson, 54 days. Elliot, 57 days. Elliot Adams, 41 days. Uh, Leslie Angeline, 13 days. Joan Sallard, pardon? 12 days. Cynthia Papermaster, 12 days. And Tarek Koff. How many? 19. 19 days. So let's give a big round of applause for all of these people that are yeah. in solidarity with the people of Guantanamo. Yes. The men in Guantanamo. Guantanamo. Yes. Code Pink Women for Peace took a group, a delegation of seven people, to Yemen, a place where 56 out of the 86 people who have been cleared for release, they're from Yemen. It is so important for our national security that we recognize what has happened, that indeed the United States of America is called the terrorist country by most countries of the world. And those families that we spoke with, families of Guantanamo prisoners, and also the families of drone strike victims from the United States, drone strikes from the United States. What is happening to the United States, what reputation we have left by these policies that the Obama administration is continu continuing and even increasing uh, is really jeopardizing our national security. Medea Benjamin will talk to us about some of the specific people that we met with. So here we're representing the names of some of the families that we met with from Yemen. And I just want to give some anecdotes from what we heard from those families. I am representing here the family of Abdul Rahman Muhammad. His family drove seven hours to meet us in Sana'a. When he went to Pakistan, he went to teach the Koran. He was detained while his wife was pregnant. His daughter is now 12 years old. She has never seen her father. Her mother named her Auda, which means come home. Auda got up and tried to speak in front of our delegation and immediately started crying and couldn't talk. Her uncle said, sometimes tears are the best message. We also met with the family of Abdul Haim. They drove 12 hours to tell us their story. He was only 17 years old when he went to Pakistan and was picked up and sent to Guantanamo. His family didn't have the heart to tell his mother where he was. 
They said he, they told her she was in the university. For years, she kept asking, where is he? Why doesn't he call? Why can't I speak to him? They said he's very busy in the university. Finally, she demanded to they tell her the truth, and they told her what happened. She was so grief-stricken that a month later, she was dead. They said she passed away, her heart aching for her son. Another family we met with was the family of Salman Yehia. Their family only found out he was in Guantanamo because they saw it on television. For an entire year, they had no idea where their son was. It was the sister who was talking to us. She said, that her family has been so affected, every sister in the family, their husbands have divorced them and taken their children. They are too scared to be associated with a family who has someone in Guantanamo. She said, we are all outcasts. We met the family of Hamad Amitani. He was 23 when he was taken away. His brother said he was chubby and had bright skin. Now he's skinny and has a weird color. He looks ashen, his eyes are sunken. Before he was detained, he was engaged. His fiance waited 10 years. 10 years she waited for him until she finally gave up, got married to someone else. And the last one I wanted to mention is the family of Hayal Aziz. And it was his brother-in-law and the mother who talked to us. The brother-in-law said, every two months we get a chance to have a video conference thanks to the Red Cross. This last time we saw him and he looked so strange. His nose was swollen. And at first we didn't understand why until we remembered that's where they force the tube down his nose for the force feeding. They said, after five months on a hunger strike, he is living in a dead body. His lawyer said that, they, that he lost consciousness and was taken to the hospital. His mother said, the only way I'm going to see my son is when he's dead. She said, Al-Qaeda is exporting terrorism. What is the US exporting? If Americans were held in Yemen under these conditions, what would Americans do? We hear there are animal rights in the United States. What about the rights of our sons? Your government is not a gang, it's not a mafia, it's a government. It is supposed to follow the rule of law. You can never return the 12 years you've taken from our sons, but please have mercy on them and have mercy on us. Go back and tell your president, please return them to us. Thank you. I'm Eileen Bakalsov. I'm from the Asian Federation Against Involuntary Disappearances from the Philippines. We work with survivors and families of the disappeared who themselves are also victims of torture. I would like to read a letter which we wrote to President Obama and sent on the 29th of April this year. We call the U.S. government to stop disappearance torture, renditions, unfair trials, and arbitrary, indefinite, and secret detention in Guantanamo. Dear President Barack Obama, as a federation of human rights organizations in Asia, AFAD is extremely concerned that at least 52, and by some accounts as many as 130 men at Guantanamo Bay detention camp are on hunger strike. The men have been subjected to treatment that violates their rights, including the confiscation of photos and letters, searches of their Korans, and brutal treatment at the hands of their guards. We understand the despair men in such a situation suffer. Most of the prisoners at Guantanamo have been cleared for release. Nonetheless, they remain imprisoned, some for over a decade now. Indefinite detention violates your own executive order of January 22, 2009, 
since in the opinion of experts, it amounts to psychological torture. The continued imprisonment of innocent men at Guantanamo Bay and the decision to indefinitely detain a number of those not deemed suitable for trial make us question the commitment of the United States to basic human rights. Please instruct the U.S. Department of Defense to meet the detainees' concrete demands regarding their day-to-day -day treatment. And please, Mr. President, take all measures necessary to release the prisoners you have cleared for release. Please ensure that the prisoners who have yet to be tried receive fair trials, those 46 46 men that have slated for indefinite detention, in your opinion, suitable for neither trial nor release, must all the same be freed. If a man cannot be convicted on evidence, he must be given his liberty. International law forbids indefinite detention. Surely your own heart forbids it as well. We stand in solidarity with the Torture Abolition and Survivor Support Coalition and all of you here, our co-member of the international, in the International Coalition Against Enforced Disappearances and other concerned human rights organizations in calling for these requests. We thank you for hearing our concerns. The Asian Federation Against Involuntary Disappearances, which is member organizations in Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, Nepal, Philippines, Sri Lanka, Thailand, South Korea, and Timor Leste. Thank you very much. Dr. Saeed. Thank you. Greetings of peace and salamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. I want to tell you how great it is how rewarding it is, you are being here in this heat, expressing your solidarity. And I want you to express solidarity of the Muslims in America with you in this great task. You know that Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Sikhism, all religions believe that there is a spark of divine, divine spark in every human being. When we torture a human being, live or dead, we are actually robbing them of that spark. We are desecrating the creation of God. So that's why every religion is against this kind of treatment. So Islam leaves no room for the torture of human beings or of other creatures of God. As American Muslims, it's extremely painful for us to see that our country has not only practiced torture as a means of interrogation, but also used the services of Muslim dictators through rendition to torture prisoners, making it a standard practice for suppressing the freedom of speech in Muslim countries. We are now in the midst of Arab Spring, celebrating the fall of many of these dictators who oppress their own people. We are glad that some of these practices practitioners of torture on mass scale have been disgraced only. Already, we hope that and pray that our country will provide the world with a model of democratic and humane values by banning this dehumanizing practice here at home. The Quran tells us that our almighty God created man and invested him with, in inherent, with an inherent dignity. The Prophet Muhammad was once asked about a woman who was, who was reported to be pious and performing all her religious duties. Even though this woman was pious and she had imprisoned her cat, and starved it to death as a means of punishment. The prophet said that because of this act of torture, the woman would be punished
punished by God and her acts of piety would not avail, would be of no avail. The companions of Prophet understood, learned that if cruelty to a cat can be so damning, cruelty to human beings is considered even more unacceptable by our Creator. Sisters and brothers, the biblical imperative to proclaim liberty to the captives has taken on critical urgency with respect to the Guantanamo hunger strikers. As we sing this song, let us remember the nine prisoners who have died since 2006 at Guantanamo. Adnan Latif cried out, where is the world to save us from torture? Where is the world to save the hunger strikers? We are here to make sure that no more prisoners die and to proclaim liberty to the captives. And so we sing. Courage, Guantanamo brothers, we seek your liberty. We will stand with you until we all are free. Let's sing it so Mr. Obama can hear us. Courage, Guantanamo brothers, we seek your liberty. We will stand with you until we all are free. somewhere between my office and here, I lost it. But I'm going to talk about the shofar anyway. 
because I think it is uh, better? Yes. Yes. How's that? Good. The shofar, I think, is very meaningful for this demonstration. The shofar is blown on the Jewish high holiday of, of the New Year, Rosh Hashanah, and it is, on one level, a call to judgment. We call the community to judge themselves. And that's what we are doing here today. We are calling our community, the great United States of America, its people, its citizens, to judgment over the fact that we keep over 100 people locked up in Guantanamo without any charge. We, call, we sound the shofar to ask God to judge us. And that's what we do today as well. And we sound the shofar to ask God to rise from his strict throne of justice and to rise to his throne of mercy and compassion. And we sound the shofar today to ask the citizens of this country to leave their judgments aside and to go and sit on the throne of mercy and consider the fate of these poor men who have been locked away for so many years and without any charge being leveled against them. And for so many of them have been cleared of any wrongdoing as well, and yet they still have not been released. And so we ask all the people of this country and the officials of our administration, the president himself, to rise from the throne of judgment to the throne of mercy. We sound different notes on the shofar. According to the Jewish tradition, the notes represent the sound of either a woman crying or of a man sighing. And we here today have tears in our eyes and we sigh in great grief because of the fate of these men. We sigh for them and what has happened to them and we also sigh and cry for what has happened to the values of the Bill of Rights in our Constitution and how they're being trampled on by these men not being charged for any wrongdoing and being locked away and put away forever. And so we come together and I wish I had the shofar here to sound but when we sound that shofar a long blast and then short interrupted blasts. A call to God and a call to us. Expression of our feeling. And one last thought. The shofar was sounded when Joshua surrounded the walls of Jericho. He sounded the shofar and the walls came down. Let us sound our own individual shofar and let the walls of Guantanamo come down. Thank you very much. Bel al Hakimi. We remember you. Sharif El Sanani. We remember you. Close Guantanamo. Hijan Saliti. We remember you. Close Guantanamo. Felain Haribi. We remember you. Close Guantanamo. Yunus Chakori. We remember you. Close Guantanamo. Said El Katani. We remember you. Close Guantanamo. Mohammed El Shabati. We remember you, Louis Guantanamo. Nabil Saeed Hajurab. We remember you, Louis Guantanamo. Omar Humzavik Abdilov. We remember you, Louis Guantanamo. Saleh Mohammed Saleh El Tabai. We remember you, Louis Guantanamo. Hamoud Abdullah Hamoud. Sayyid Nasir El Azaini. We remember you, Close Guantanamo. Ahmad Abdullah Hassan. We remember you, Close Guantanamo. Mohammed Abdullah Ta Matan. We remember you, Close Guantanamo. We remember these and all the prisoners, the detainees in Guantanamo. We call on this administration and Congress to order their immediate release, to end the crime of indefinite detention and torture, and to make reparations to the victims. And we call upon the powers that be responsible for imprisoning these men to repent publicly for this sin and crime. Let us sing together. Courage, Guantanamo brothers, 
We seek your liberty. We will stand with you until we all are free. Courage, Guantanamo brothers. We seek your liberty. We will stand with you until we all are free. Courage, Guantanamo brothers.